Police, move! Who pooped us out? Then it was fresh when De Niro was lampooning himself and you know, yeah. being, yes. you know, doing a doing a comic rip on his on his character. When that became his main thing for a while, I let like then it became uh, mm -hmm. him stepping on his own legacy. Like I mean, Meet the Parents was great, you know. Analyze, you know, analyze this was great, but then sequels to all of those. Suddenly, all he was doing, yeah, was, was riffs on his on his on his. Uh, persona you know and that uh, 
because he still got it, but he was he was he was acting as if all I mean, he was acting as if that's what he needed to do. Just like you know, it was a nostalgia act, pick, picking apart it, you know, picking apart his old stuff. A couple things about this that, to your point, number one, you're right. Uh, uh, two, uh, uh, Oma um, Midnight Run is what makes it fantastic to me is the secret ingredient in a lot of films, which is Yafit Koto. Uh -huh. uh, Yafit Koto is the magic element. I mean, honestly, you could cast Yafit Koto for me as Scrooge. You can cast him as Quentin Jaws. Yafit Koto, it's not the dimension you want, but it's the dimension you deserve sometimes. Yafit Koto brings, a, he brought a lot of Yafit Koto magic, but also to your point to De Niro, we had him on a couple of movies at Warner Brothers. I'm sure your cousin has told you. Um, and what we suspect what feature development thought at the time because that wasn't no one missed the point you made everyone was like why is he doing this the guy was taxi driver he was in the godfather too really? you know oh, you see yeah that. and what the consensus was was that de niro was just tired hmm. of the dead level of dedication his craft took for decades and he just kind of wanted to work but not with the um, the labor of having to be De Niro. And that's what we kind of deduced between the ground on the set and in the office. Okay. That And right or wrong, you know, the guy gets to a point where he can choose the projects and do what he wants to do. And and likewise, we can have an opinion about him. But I, 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 that makes sense when you hear it, though, doesn't Absolutely. it? Like he kind of. Yeah, I, I can give him that. And I mean, I'm not criticizing. I mean, you know, he's he's one of the greats. He's one of my favorites. He's he's amazing. Mm -hmm. he, he owned the seventies and the eighties, and uh, you know, and uh, um, you know, with with Pacino and Hoffman, and um, yeah. of course, Pacino post scent of a woman just became the yeah Bwah! yeah yeah yeah. I mean, before that, he was like it too. You know, I mean, look, Pacino gave us a lot of magic and continues to to some degree. I think, like, I, think I felt, I kind of felt like Heat was in a way the last stand for those guys. Um, they've had some performances since, of course, but that was like the last big. And that's a movie I do not love. I I know I get a lot of hate for that. People love that film. I personally think that the actors in it are underutilized, and it goes in places it doesn't need to go. But that's just my opinion. But I think that was kind of like the last two off. It is a bit windy that that story for uh Yeah. Yeah, for what it is. And and the whole De Niro and Pacino never meeting up kind of thing is, is, is interesting. Yeah, and this is sacred territory. There's people that absolutely love that movie and they worship every frame. And that's okay. I mean, a good friend of ours is the villain in that Wayne Grove, Kevin Gage. We love him. And he didn't expect to get it, got the part because he looked like Jesus. <laughs> um, and he is by far one of the great outstanding people as well as actors out there. And so in that sense, you're rooting for it, but do we need to see this guy go off the track, kill prostitutes? Do we need to see Val Kilmer's relationship fall apart? Do we need to, you know, do we need to see De Niro fall in love with the woman? I mean, I think you need that one actually, now that I talk about it, I think you need that one, but do you need to see Natalie Portman not get along? I mean, for me, like a lot of that stuff I don't need, but for other people who are film purists, they love all that drama that's tied to it. I'm just like, Hey man, blow the armor truck. Go like, look, I don't need to see the family drama. Let's just get to the elements and start them having them face off. Cause that's really what the movie was about to me. And Hey, it's an opinion. So film bros back <laughs> off me. If you don't like what you're hearing, go ahead and watch the movie. You're welcome to, there's some good people in it. There's some really good people in it. Henry Rollins. Uh -huh. Yeah, anyway. I mean, I, I I did see like a you know talking about movies on the big screen. I did go watch the twenty uh, fifth um, anniversary screening of it with uh, with Michael. Oh, Mann. and how yeah. was Michael at it? He had a lot to say. I mean, he, he uh, it was uh, it was it was good though. I mean, it was like it was it, I saw it at the uh, you know the Village Theater in Westwood, and so it was a, a good place to good place to see a movie with a lot so of you... but a, with a lot of diehard fans, as you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. Uh, it was a well, very... only diehard fans go to that stop, yeah. right? I'd like to hear what Michael Mann had to say. And actually, I thought he made a real good run at The Insider. That was a subject matter that if he handed me the script, I don't know if I'd buy it, but he made it really interesting. Um, and he was known as a guy that got very loud at Warner Brothers. He was not <laughs> uh, um, probably in ways he shouldn't have. Um, mm -hmm. But that's between me and Mann. We'll have that conversation at some point down the road. Um, you know, and I miss the guy. Michael, look me up. We'll talk Manhunter. Yeah.